from New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, barreling into a triple header of central bank meetings with inflation cooling around the globe, all as the riskier credits continue to outperform. We begin with the big issue, waiting for the Fed. The Fed and their tightening campaigns. Widely assumed they're going to hike in July. July is baked in the cake, higher for longer. Hike by 25 basis points. The Fed might need to get a little bit more aggressive here. Inflation data coming down uh, faster. Not a lot of indication yet of um, greater labor market weakness. Consumer is showing up. There's been some really welcome news for the Fed as of late. The last inflation print was quite low. We're expecting inflation to come down. The economy is going to surprise people by its resilience. The data is kind of starting to show us that maybe we won't have that recession. What is the right inflation target for the world we're living in today? How high will they be willing to, to tolerate? At some point, we do think the recession is going to come. Joining us now, I'm thrilled to say we have PIMCO's Tony Crescenzi and Bank of America's Megan Swiber joining me on set on a Friday. So uh, must be my lucky week. And yeah. we're, of course, meeting before the Fed meeting next week. And Tony, getting away from the how many more hikes are left, it seems like July is baked in at this point. How long might this Fed be on hold? Well, the view of rate cuts flies in the face of Paul Volcker, the legendary Fed chair. And his idea of keeping at it, of course, the title of a book he had. Uh, Chair Powell, over, over a year ago, said that one of the three lessons of history is to keep at it, to sustain the higher uh, rate of uh, the Fed funds rate uh, in order to keep the pressure on inflation, the downward pressure on inflation. Uh, the Fed doesn't want to make the mistakes that have happened historically, which is to, uh, rate, to cut rates prematurely. So mm -hmm. you should expect the Fed to keep at it for some time until it's clear and, and by clear, we mean through inflation expectations that the job is done because the inflation data alone won't cut it. The Fed has to feel that households are confident that the inflation rate will be down over the long run, too. Mm -hmm. And Megan, Tony brings up Paul Volcker. So let's talk about Ben Bernanke because we actually heard from the former Fed chair this week. He weighed in on the next move saying that it looks very clear that the Fed will raise another 25 basis points at its next meeting. It's possible this increase in July might be the last one. And Megan, if it's July and done, how does that work itself through the Treasury curve? How are you thinking about opportunities at the short end versus the long end? Sure, Katie. Great question. So what, what we see borne out in history is that you really want to be buying the last hike of the cycle, particularly further out the curve. So we do think that going long tens as we're nearing the Fed's final hike makes a lot of sense. You usually see the 10-year rate rally around 100 basis points or so in the 12 months after the Fed's delivered that final hike. Markets right now are only pricing about a 10 basis point rally or so. So we think that those long positions are well served, but important to be putting them further out the curve. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at what's priced into the front end, and, and Tony was just making this point earlier, there's a lot of question marks around how long the Fed is going to stay on hold. But the market's pricing a full 25 basis point cut by the first quarter of next year. So we do think that there's more room for the curve to invert further. We like being long further out, but we do think that ultimately the cuts priced in right now are, are largely overstated. And I want to get to the message that the yield curve is sending, but you bring up duration. I'm glad you went there because we actually uh, got the annual investment letter, one of the investment letters from former PIMCO CIO Bill Gross, and he wrote that with inflation back to 3% or so and the Fed nearing the end of its tightening cycle, it would appear to many that a new bond bull market is about to begin. But while I think that the 10-year at 380 may have peaked at 4% for 2023, a bull market is not in the cards. So, Megan, you've got Bill Gross on the other side of the trade. <laughs> Tony, where do you fall? Well, uh, you would say, and I, we would agree with Megan, uh, in fact, 90% of the time since 1978, core bonds, those with duration, let's say, of six and a half years, average maturity in the sevens or so, have outperformed cash, T-bills and such, 90% uh, of the time, by an average of three percentage points over three-year rolling periods. So looking back three years from now to today, it's likely that these longer matures will fare well. 
And so it's a fool's game to some extent to keep playing the T-bill money market game. Blink and you may miss the next big bond rally. So the time is now for total return styled investing to get the gains that Megan suggested could occur because a move of 70, 80 basis points or so on a 10-year instrument mm. means a lot in terms of price gains. And you never know when that'll happen and for what reason. And so now is the time, and his history suggests it, when the Fed is about to be done and with its rate hike cycle, call it a few months, that's the time to be investing in longer maturities. Withstand, we would suggest, the volatility that that could bring in the interim because you can't time a diversifier as bonds are. And so mm -hmm. we would suggest being leery about doing so. So it sounds like the opportunity of cost of cash is very real right now. It's speaking over the long term because, mm -hmm. uh, well, it is quite attractive and you do want some liquidity, but you've got to be sure that you're getting uh, a return for that liquidity. In short-term funds such as, such as those that we have, managed by Jerome Schneider, for example, the carry, uh, the yield to maturity, uh, in the, is in the zone of over 6% or so. Uh, but you want to be sure that you can part with the liquidity to get those yields. But we think there's always some, for many investors, I should say, uh, ability to part with liquidity to get that extra yield closer to 6%. Mm -hmm. And I do want to get back to the yield curve because that's really been one of the big stories in the market, that extremely stubborn inversion that we're seeing. And what it's actually signaling, Megan, I was reading your notes and I, this stuck out to me, that the deeper curve inversion doesn't necessarily mean that recession risk is higher. Talk to us what you mean by that and what this curve actually is suggesting. Sure, Katie. So I think that when we look at recession probability models, for example, right, they largely take into account the shape of the yield curve, the very deep inversion that we're seeing. And if you look at those, that would suggest that recession risk is elevated right now. But what the curve inversion is telling us and what the curve tends to get right is anticipating Fed policy action. So the curve inversion is really telling us this message, this ex expectation for the Fed to be cutting. But the Fed can be cutting for different reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So in recent cycles, right, the Fed is cutting alongside the downturn that we saw following the pandemic. Um, it's cutting during the global financial crisis, but the Fed can be cutting this time. And what the market's actually reflecting is cuts alongside inflation moderating very quickly. So certainly we've gotten a lot of good news on this in, in, in recent inflation prints, but the market's pricing not only this perfect storm of inflation falling right now, but that continuing over time. And the Fed operating uh, at a policy rate as aggressive as they are right now, five, over you know 5% after they deliver this, this next hike, um, ultimately will become more restrictive mm. at a lower inflation rate. So it argues for them being able to cut alongside moderating inflation, which we think is really the message that the curve is telling us right now, not so much these cuts alongside a material growth downturn. So in a way, just to draw this point out, it sounds like almost what you're saying is that the fact that the curve is this inverted is in some way an endorsement of the Fed's policy absolutely, and their path. Absolutely. And I would say that you know the one thing that Powell can look back on and really see a lot of credibility on is the inflation market uh, and five-year, five-year break-evens, which are the Fed's uh, view into how the market's reading these longer-term inflation expectations that, that Tony mentioned, um, they've been consistently pricing the Fed being able to hit that 2% target over the long run, even alongside a lot of volatility in, in spot inflation. So there's a lot of credibility that the market is giving the Fed right now. Katie, I was going to say, and I agree with Megan, that it's the, it's the confidence in the Federal Reserve that it will keep inflation down, do mm -hmm. whatever it takes, if you will, uh, that is causing it in part. Uh, secondly, this is what's called the term premium effect, uh, which is the impact of Fed policy and the bond purchases that it, that it made in the past on yields. Uh, consider, for example, the Federal Reserve holds two and a half trillion dollars worth of mortgages. It has five trillion dollars worth of treasuries. Uh, it took a lot of bonds off the shelves several years ago during the pandemic. So go to those shelves today. There aren't fewer items on those shelves, so the prices are naturally are higher. Uh, as the Fed puts some of those items back on the shelves, mm -hmm. the term premium, the additional yield you get for going out the yield curve, will start to rise. And so that will begin to affect yields. But the biggest factor, and I would say, I agree with Megan, is the confidence in the Fed, a view on future rate cuts uh, in terms of uh, uh, where yields are go eventually going. And again, it's another message to investors to, to, to not wait too long 
uh, in adding duration to, to turn into to turn toward total return style investing, income style investing, anything where you can get mm -hmm. the capital gain and high quality assets. So there's, I mean, five different points that I could dig into there that are interesting. But Megan, you also made the point that it's not just a recession that would cause the Fed to cut. We're in restrictive territory now. I don't think that's controversial to say. And just getting out of restrictive territory will require some rate cuts. So Tony, I have kind of a difficult question. Where do you think neutral is in this economy? Uh, the PIMCO view since 2014 is that the neutral rate is somewhere between zero and a half point above the inflation rate, so call it two and a half or so. It's, it, it may be evolving. There's a debate about the impact of demographics, for example. We know that 1957, I've mentioned this uh, fact before, it's the biggest birth year last century. So that means, fast forward 65 plus years later, big wave of retirement, it's the biggest wave in history. It's mm -hmm. reducing the amount of labor uh, supply, and this will continue through 2030, pushing up wages, and that could have an impact for all we know, on the neutral rate. Secondly, there's this movement worldwide to invest uh, in defense and to invest in the brown to green energy, energy transition, et cetera, uh, supply chains. All that might, might raise uh, spending and reduce the saving glut that has kept interest rates down. It could also boost productivity, which can have an influence, an upward influence, on the, neutra the neutral rate. So, uh, it, so the jury's out, but we're sticking with the idea that it's lower than his historical, and that'll keep yields low, and the yield curve probably reflects that. And we don't have much time left, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that it's not just the Fed next week. Of course, we have the ECB and the BOJ as well. And Megan, when you look at that lineup, where do you think the most risk for a surprise comes from? Which region, which central bank? Oh, that's a good question, Katie. You know, I think ultimately the message that we're hearing across all central banks right now is this commitment to data dependence. So central banks right now are also pretty limited in, in terms of how much they can ultimately shock the market because so much of the path forward here is really going to come down to the data. Mm -hmm. We're going to hear that from the Fed next week. The story is going to be a lot more about the focus around what they're ultimately going to do next. And at the end of the day, the Fed needs to be able to push back against some of this easing in financial conditions that we've seen following CPI, the, 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 the relatively muted reading that we've recently gotten. So all of those things together do lend itself to central banks needing to keep that expectation out there for potential adjustments higher in, in, in overnight policy rates. All right, a lot to look forward to. This is a great preview, you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Katie. Thank Our you. thanks to Megan Swiber and Tony Crescenzi. Up next, it's the auction block. Big bank earnings driving the week of issuance. That's next. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifeld. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the auction block, where big bank earnings drove sales this week. The U.S. high-grade primary market saw weekly volume push past $30 billion, topping the high-end of estimates. Wells Fargo was the main contributor, contributor, pricing two separate deals totaling more than $10 billion. I want to dig deeper into those banks as they saw some massive demand. Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, and that Wells Fargo sale all saw their order books easily outpace their sales. And investors also piled into the leverage loan and high-yield bond market. Just Monday alone saw eight new loan deals and four junk bond sales. The week totaled more than $3 billion in high yield. Meanwhile, Gershon Distenfeld of Alliance Bernstein says that the current environment presents a buying opportunity. We think that bonds are Bonds are back, so to speak. We're at yields now across the spectrum, going out even into corporates, emerging market debt, and, and other parts of fixed income, where the total return you're going to see, or the potential at least, is a lot higher than it's been for most of the past decade. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say we have Maureen O'Connor of Wells Fargo and Zach Griffiths of Credit Sites. Great to have you both with us. Zach, I want to start with you. Between very bearish and pound the table bullish, where do you fall on this corporate credit market? I'd say we are bullish. And really, that's adjusted a bit recently. I think the move in high yield has gone a little bit too far. And so we did recently downgrade high yield to market perform from outperform. And that's not to say that we're moving to a cautious outlook on a high yield, but we are recognizing that the opportunity for spread compression from here is probably limited. 
forward returns do look great on a six month and 12 month basis. And so we do think that's still a good trade, but we recognize that the possibility for additional tightening is probably limited. And we also maintain an outperform recommendation on investment grade. We have a spread target of 120 basis points. So are looking for a little bit more tightening there. So definitely in the bullish camp overall. And Zach, I want to get to that high yield call, but let's talk about investment grade, Maureen, because right now IG spreads are already at 120 basis points, really close to the narrowest levels of this year. How much lower could spreads feasibly go from here? Uh, Yeah, so I think we agree with Zach in that our longer term view is bullish um, across credit products, including investment grade. But I think in the near term sense, we're probably a little bit more neutral and that we've come very far, very fast. Um, If you look at the index level, as you you note, um, you know, we are trading uh, very close to the year to date tights, only about five basis points wide of the tights we saw back in uh, mid Q1. Um, A lot of the higher quality industrial names are already trading at their year to date tights. Um, So if there is any sector level performance, performance from here. It's probably within financials, perhaps further down the, uh, the rating spectrum with some further spread uh, compression across triple Bs. Um, but as a whole, um, it does feel like in the near term sense, spreads are pretty fully valued in this current range. And we see a little bit maybe more downside risk to spreads over the next couple of months versus uh, upside potential. And let's talk about that narrowness that we've seen. It's come with really very little volatility. There was a really interesting uh, report out from Barclays, I believe, looking at the past three weeks, Zach, high-grade spreads have traded within a range of just three basis points. That is the narrowest band in 18 months. And given that we're already at your year-end target for investment-grade spreads, what kind of volatility do you expect from here? Or could we just continue to grind sideways? I think grinding sideways is a possibility and the lack of volatility we've seen I think comes to interest rate volatility coming down quite a bit at least in an aggregate level looking across the curve and you've also had limited volatility in equities and FX and so I think financial markets are coming around to the view that at least the Fed is almost done tightening. We are expecting a 25 basis point rate hike next week and for the Fed to remain on hold for the remainder of the year. So I think a lot of the macro volatility that we've gotten used to over the past year and a half is starting to subside. That's a positive for spreads. And so in terms of additional tightening, perhaps it's limited, but with yields at these levels, we think it's an attractive prospect and is likely to bring a tailwind of technical demand in the second half of this year. Well, let's talk about that technical demand, because even with this conversation that we're having about a range bound market spreads fully valued, it's an important point that there's still a lot of demand out there. And Maureen, in your notes, you point out that if you look at the fund flows, people are clearly coming into that asset class. Break down the demand. What types of buyers are emerging here? Uh, Yeah, you know, we're in sort of a a bit of a sweet spot in that we've seen a return of the total rate of return buyer. So this is different than last year where we had, you know, record breaking outflows across high grade ETFs and mutual funds. That dynamic has almost reversed itself this year. We've had nearly unbroken inflows every single week into high grade funds this year, with the exception of, you know, a couple of weeks right around the regional bank crisis in March. Um, We've erased almost 80 percent of the full year um, uh, uh, outflows we saw in 2022 uh, to this point. So you you have a return of total rate of return buyers chasing what's been about a three and a half percent returning year for the asset class. But then on top of that, and as was noted, um, you know, with yields remaining elevated like they are, we still have a very attractive entry point for our more yield focused buyers. So pension funds, insurance companies, LDI buyers, um, yields are still trading about 150 basis points above outstanding coupons on the index. Um, so you have this perfect storm of, you know, a number of different buyers chasing investment grade. All the while, um, supply has been pretty moderate this year. We're down about 3% versus last year's volume. So that technical has been quite strong. Mm -hmm. And so that's the investment grade backdrop. A lot of demand there. I want to talk a little bit more about the high yield side of things because we heard from Amanda Lynham over at BlackRock earlier this week saying that there could be weakness ahead in those riskier credits. There's probably some scope for resilience still at the high end of the high yield spectrum. We don't view a recession as a necessary ingredient for an uptick in default. And Zach, like you mentioned earlier in this interview, you recently downgraded the high yield market to market weight from overweight earlier this month. Where do you see is the fundamental backdrop when it comes to some of these junk rated companies out there? 
I think you're really, Katie, seeing a bifurcation in terms of the lowest rated credits really showing signs of deterioration in fundamentals. And so triple C's have performed very well so far this year, but we'd really emphasize very focused credit and security selection if you're going to go very far down the credit spectrum. If you remain up in triple B's again, or double B's, excuse me, that's certainly a very attractive place in terms of yield. And we haven't seen the deterioration in credit fundamentals. You're seeing a softening there, but we think it's really manageable at this point in terms of other factors in the economy, including plenty of cash on companies' balance sheets, providing some financial flexibility, even as borrowing costs rise. We're really not looking for the maturity wall to hit until 2025. And so if yields and rates are still at five and a half or six percent in terms of the policy rate going into the second half of 2024, that could really become an issue, but that's not our base case. And so we think that, you know, high yield is still a great place to be, but you need to be careful with your rating selection. And Maureen, we don't have much time left, but I want to get your thought on the second part of what Amanda Leinem said, that we don't view a recession as a necessary ingredient for an uptick in defaults. When you think about this demand that we've seen for investment grade, would a recession scare away some of, away some of those buyers? Um, I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, what you'll see is ratings decompression, right? You're going to see investors gravitate towards the highest quality names up the stack, um, single A and double A rated names, and you'll see triple Bs underperform in that environment. Mm -hmm. But remember, our market is driven a lot by base rates, right? And so in a recessionary environment, treasury yields are likely to rally, and that rally will generate positive returns in fixed income. And those returns will attract those total rate of return buyers to the extent the losses that you see on the spread widening don't overcompensate for that move lower in rates. And that tends not to be the case. So right. said another way, we would still expect to see investors buying investment grade as, as a safe haven play um, and also a place where you could still potentially eke out some positive returns even in a recessionary environment. All right, Maureen and Zach, got to leave it there. Really appreciate your time. And a reminder that right now, Biden, President Biden, is now speaking following a meeting with seven leading artificial intelligence firms about a new agreement for AI safeguards. You can check that out at LiveGo on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifeld. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the final spread. The week ahead coming up, we have the Nasdaq rebalancing Monday, Tuesday, tech earnings Wednesday. It's the Fed's rate decision. Then we have the ECB on Thursday and Friday. It's the BOJ. Global central banks, the one to keep an eye on from New York. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.